yeah, it was very powerful. Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in your sight. My rock and my redeemer. Amen. We've been going through a series here um, on Faith Matters. And I'm continuing in that thread uh, over the next few sermons that we have. Really inviting us to examine our faith at a deeper level and recognize that what we believe really does matter. And we need to think about what we believe and understand how it applies to our lives, to the structure of our faith. I began by trying to illustrate how creation is really the foundation of our faith. That if we create instability or lack of clarity in creation, it really swipes our feet out from underneath our faith and uh, it does not work. And then we looked at the cross, how really the cross is the heartbeat of our faith. It's the engine. It's the center of everything that matters uh, in our, our faith. And then we went to prophecy and uh, looked at how prophecy really is where the seat of consciousness is for our faith and uh, it, how it's much more than just uh, predictions of the, the future or patterns of the past. That prophecy is really designed by God to be a blessing for our present uh, circumstance and how necessary and needful it is for us to be engaged with prophecy. I heard it said before that uh, a Christian without prophecy is like a brain-dead Christian. We have to understand and value the gift of prophecy. And then the last uh, sermon I had, we had Elder Reggie here last week, but before that, I had tried to illustrate how the Sabbath is like the circulatory system. It ties it all together. It supplies blood to, to all of it that uh, keeps all of it functioning well, and it was designed that way uh, by God to keep this body of faith healthy and moving forward in, in the analogy. Today, I'm going to, today, and actually next week, uh, going to take a little bit of a, a different angle uh, of faith and be looking a, a little bit more at the structure of faith by examining the topic of character. Character. And uh, I hope that it'll be of value to our journey and our discussion together. But I do like to engage with the young people and uh, invite them to participate in uh, the interactive quiz at the beginning of the message here. So um, in, in honor of this being National Women's Month, <laughs> uh, I thought it would be fun. And I have used Hebrews quite a bit. And we, beginning with the series, I, I took us on a little bit of a, an examination of Hebrews 11. Uh, but I wanted to ask the question about the women that are featured in Hebrews 11. So the question is, what women are named or implied in Hebrews 11? And I'm going to give you a little bit of help. There are two women that are named by directly, but there's several others that are indirectly implied or referenced, and, and we'll look at those for just a minute. But first of all, who knows the first one? Abraham's wife. What was her name? All right, I saw Ketsia's hand go up. It was Sarah. That's right. So she is mentioned by name in Hebrews 11. She's one of the, uh, the heroes of faith. By faith, uh, Sarah was able to conceive and bore a child to Abraham in his old age. Who's the second one here? Who's the helper of spies? Ooh, sounds so devious. I saw Declan's hand. And I do see your hand too, Chloe, but we're going to let... Declan, do you know who that is? Can you, can you see? Rahab, I heard you say it nice and loud. Good job. Sarah, Rahab is the other one mentioned by name, by faith. Rahab uh, uh, welcomed the spies uh, when, when uh, Israel attacked Jericho. Now, I just want to pause here for a moment. It's quite remarkable when you think of it that these two women, I mean, maybe not so much Sarah, right? Because she's the mother of Israel, right? She was the, the, the faithful spouse 
to Abraham that was with him in all of his journeys and trials, and there were some mistakes along the way. So we're not maybe not too surprised that Sarah would be there, but isn't it kind of interesting that Rahab is? I mean, here in the book of Hebrews, trying to appeal to the Jewish Christians in, in, in a way of looking at it, that this Gentile prostitute who, who did a good thing, yes, she allowed uh, God's uh, spies to be uh, there and, and to be delivered and uh, uh, overcome that city. But just the juxtaposition between those two ladies is interesting. Sarah and Rahab, both of them uh, enshrined by name in this great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. But there are some others. The, the ones in blue are ones that are implied. They're not mentioned by name. Who hid her son in an ark? Oh my goodness, Chloe, I, I saw your hand go up and you said it so loud and well. Oh, that is awesome. And not only that, she knew her name. Way to go, Chloe. I am so proud of you. Very good. Yes, that is her name. Moses was the son of Amram and Jochebed. And uh, it doesn't mention her by name. It just says by faith, Moses was hidden when he was an infant. So it just mentions that, you know, obviously she was involved in that. And uh, that was part of the story. Then it mentions in Hebrews that women received back their dead by resurrection. Women received back their dead. Who were the women that had sons resurrected. We don't know their names, but can you tell me anything about them and you will get bonus credit points today? Anyone? Oh boy, this was a stumper. This is a stumper. Any of our young people? Okay, Geo. Oh, okay, very interesting. Yeah, that's possible. London? No, no, that's not the one we're looking for. These are two Old Testament stories of, uh, of some women who had sons that were resurrected. I see Caleb all the way in the back. Caleb, you're going to have to shout for me. Uh, the, the widow, I heard that, yeah. Uh, and But I heard you say the hardest part of it was of Zarephath. Is that what you said? Is mom helping with that? Maybe I didn't say it right in Spanish. I don't know. <laughs> yes, one was the widow. One was the widow. And do you know how to define the other one, uh, Sebastian? Uh, yes, the, the widow was with Elijah. That's right. I see you cheating on the computer there. That's all right. The other one has a, an interesting name. She's the, you want to try her? All right. All right. Yeah. John. The mother of Lazarus. She did receive her son back from the dead. That's true. But we're going Old Testament here. I'm just going to give it to you. The widow of Zarephath was who Elijah uh, uh, was able to minister to, and God uh, resurrected her son. The other one was the Shunammite woman, the Shunammite woman that Elisha ministered to. So those are probably the two women that are referred to and implied in the book of uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. But there is one more fascinating implication in Hebrews 11 that I would invite you to think about just for a moment. Barak. And all of you are going, yes, of course, I know exactly what you mean, Barak. Barak is mentioned in Hebrews 11. And it's very interesting that Barak is mentioned. You want to know why? Let's just look at it for a second. Judges chapter 4. Barak said to her. Who's the her? Kids? Who do you think the her is? Who's the most famous her in the book of Judges, I wonder? Declan, do you want to do this one? Deborah! Deborah! 
Barak said to Deborah, if you'll go with me, then I will go. And she said, and then he says, if you do not go with me, I will not go. And then she said, I will go with you. But nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours, Barak. But on the journey that you're about to take, the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of another woman. So the story of Barak is really the story of two other women who played a prominent role in the deliverance uh, of that, uh, of that uh, time period in the book of Judges. So Deborah is one of them. The Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And the other woman's name is J-L, by the way, J-A-E-L, J-L. And yeah, I know, I'm not going to, it's just children present, Jeff. We're going <laughs> to read that one later. Uh, but these two women are heralded as the, uh, the, the most prominent aspects of this story. And yet Hebrews doesn't say Deborah and doesn't say Jael. It, rather, it says, for time will not tell me if I tell of Jephthah and Barak and Samson and, and, and Samuel and the other prophets. But Barak is mentioned. Now, there's all kinds of reasons why this might be. The, the, the interesting thing is you cannot really imply a, uh, a, a secular kind of fleshly thing. You say, oh, the Bible just hates women, and so it wanted to say Barak instead of a woman. Because it's already mentioned Sarah and Rahab, right? In other words, the, the, the inclusion of Barak I think is fascinating because it invites the Bible reader to remember that it was Barak who... Uh, uh, showed that he was willing to have trust in a woman and that by that trust, then his honor was transferred to another woman, J.L. So I think by implication, Hebrews is honoring the women involved in the story of Barak. And we are invited to study that and think of that. So I just think it's very interesting that uh, be long before Barak became president, he was uh, working with Deborah in the book of Judges. Deborah arose. And, and then this the song of Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges, which is a fascinating thing. Well, I want to talk about character today. Character. Character is the moral and mental qualities that define us. Uh, I had to look at several dictionaries. I wanted to try to find some pithy ways of, of just kind of ex explaining and examining what we're looking at today. It's the moral and mental qualities that define us. You, if you're a person of character, right, what does it mean? That you have good, strong, moral, and mental qualities. It's the attributes or features that distinguish our individuality. So each character is unique, right? We might all have good character, but one person's character is individually unique from another character. Character is our essential nature, our basic way of life, or our fundamental personality. So here's the question. Does character matter to our faith? Now, I want you just to think about this for a second. Does it matter what kind of character that we have in our faith? Now, the reason I hesitate on this is because in my opinion and in my experience, it is far too often that I find that maybe not mentally, maybe we, won't, won't, we don't consciously say this, but for a lot of Christians, live this way as though character doesn't matter. Okay? Hey, I believe the truth. I know what the Bible says. I know what I believe. I can drive however I want to drive. Uh, we may not think it like that. We may not always put it together in that way. But for a lot of people, the way they experience Christianity, at best, character is secondary to faith. You all know those Christians who feel like they can say whatever they want. They can tell you the truth because they believe the truth, and it doesn't really matter whether you want to hear the truth or not. I'm telling you the truth, and you better believe the truth, and if you don't believe the truth, it's your problem, buddy. And it illustrates that they lack character, but they have faith. They have the truth. There's a fascinating story from history. Um, Martin Luther was quite a guy. I'm looking forward to seeing Luther in heaven. I believe he'll be there. All right? He's quite a guy, quite a character. And he had a lot of people around him that tried to temper his emotions. Um, uh, Calvin was one of them. Uh, Melanchthon was one of them. But uh, Desiderius Erasmus was another one. Erasmus was the principal uh, uh, translator of what we now use as the King James Bible, the, the Textus Receptus, uh, 
is largely the result of Erasmus's efforts and scholarship. Erasmus and Luther, and Luther did not get along. They were high scholars of their time, and they were extremely passive-aggressive. And when they would discuss faith together, mostly through letters, um, they're, they're actually quite funny. Luther would write to, to Erasmus and say, Oh, Erasmus, you of great wisdom and knowledge, who stands heads and shoulders above all the scholarship of the earth, if only you understood how stupid you really are. He, he would really write that. And then Erasmus would do the same thing to him. Oh, Luther, you of great knowledge of intellect and understanding of Greek and Hebrew, and yet you are such an idiot about this. And they play themselves off like this all the time. And it's, uh, um, um, I, just, I just love the, the realism of these characters in history. Sometimes we just see the edifice of Luther and we think, oh, this guy was just whatever. But he was a real person as well. Um, but there was an occasion where Erasmus writes to Luther and he, he chastises him, as he does in a lot of his letters. Um, and he says, look, and, and forgive me, I'm not going to give the entire history of everything, but um, the, the quote that is, is the, the most uh, applicable to the, what I'm getting at here is he says, look, Luther, it is not expedient nor helpful to our cause or to the work of Jesus Christ if we tell every person every truth in every circumstance and situation. It is not expedient to the faith and to the gospel of Jesus Christ if we tell every truth to every person in every situation. In other words, you've got to also consider the circumstance and how your character is impacting people that you're telling about. Character. I don't know if this uh, analogy will work for you either. I've, I was never really into automobiles when I was growing up. It's not, I'm not really a motorhead type person. Um, you know, did not really obsess about cars. But there was a car that I saw uh, growing up that I always envisioned that I thought would be fun to have, and that was a, a Mustang, a Ford Mustang. Uh, I, I, I just, you know, for all the options of cars, that was just the one I liked. And I remember um, as I was growing up, different friends of mine would kind of uh, be, be able to kind of get cars that they dreamed about having and wanting, and they would kind of get it and say, oh yeah, this is my little sports car, or this is this is mine. And I always wondered, at what level does having a car qualify as having a car. If you owned a Ford Mustang, but it didn't run, can you still say I own a Ford Mustang? Okay, so it doesn't have to run. Okay, let's say it doesn't have seats or tires or a steering wheel. Can you still say I own a Ford Mustang? Okay, uh, let's say it doesn't have doors or fenders or, or all you got is the chassis, just the little skeleton, and it's sitting in your yard. Can you, hey, I've got a Ford Mustang. Can you still say that? You, you can? Wow. What if you have a little model? Little metal, and the doors work? Can you say, I own a Ford Mustang? Geo, I think in the context of character and our faith, sometimes we, we argue with ourselves or we gamble. I can remove as much of this from my faith and I still have the essential kernel. I don't necessarily have to have the tires. I still have faith. I don't have to have the engine. It doesn't have to run. I still have it. And sometimes we put character uh, off to the side and say, I have enough that it's still faith. And maybe one day I'll get the character. Maybe one day I'll find on eBay that they're selling the tires or whatever, and then I'll have it. And I think that that is the challenge for us. Um, when we go through Hebrews 11, I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but um, all of the characters of, of faith that are mentioned, they always have an attached action that goes with their faith. By faith, Abel did something. He offered to God. By faith, Enoch obtained the witness. By faith, Noah did something. He prepared an ark. By faith, Abraham did lots of things. He obeyed and he went out and did all these things. By faith, Sarah had a baby. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Jacob worshiped. By faith, Joseph gave orders concerning. By faith, Moses was hidden by his parents. By faith, Moses uh, did lots of things. He chose Israel over Egypt and lots of statements there. By faith, Rahab welcomed the spies. 
Faith is always attached with an action in Hebrews 11. Faith accomplishes something in the lives of those who have it. It is not simply a static being. I'm a person of faith. Really, well, what would you do? Nothing. I just believe. I believe. And it's great that I believe. Oh, you believe. Yes, I believe. Well, what does it do in your life? What does it do to your character and how you live? Faith is effectual. Faith accomplishes things. Faith affects us and it affects those around us. It is not possible to simply have a, a, a hidden faith or, or a, a faith that is private that does not affect anyone. Faith always is effective and effectual. Faith makes us useful to God. And I just want you to remember that word useful. Faith makes us useful to God. Uh, if we're going to have faith, that, 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 it, that, that Ford Mustang's got to go somewhere or else it's not very useful. So it's in my yard and it's useful for me to look at, but it doesn't really do anything else. I think that we're lacking uh, what makes that vehicle run, then it is not as useful as it could be. Faith makes us useful. Faith changes us and those around us. Faith invites the character of God in us. I don't remember where this quote came from. I had it in my notes. From I did not write this. I found it in my notes. Some pastor, great pastor somewhere must have said it. It is the work of every believer to apply themselves to the upward task of growing into the likeness of Christ. I think that's true. Do you think that's true? It is the work of every believer to apply themselves to the upward task of growing into the likeness of Christ, becoming like Jesus. I think that's true. Um, and six volume of the testimonies. True sanctification is harmony with God, oneness with Him in, what's the word? Oneness with Him in character. Character. So does character matter to our Christian faith? Does it matter? Well, I believe it does. Oneness with Him in character. Our character does matter. We are to learn from Christ. We're to have His attitude in us. We're to follow His example. We're to walk in the manner as He walked. All throughout Scripture, we are invited to embrace the reality of who Jesus is in our lives and make that effectual in our lives. Not just simply static things that we believe and we keep in our mind or that we study once a week in, in, in church. It should affect our lives in every way that we walk. Now, I wanted to get to this place because uh, this is the main uh, passage that I'm going to spend the last few moments of the sermon with you today. This comes from the little book of Philemon. When was the last time you read Philemon, huh? Come on now. Philemon is where I want to take you um, this morning. As I was studying and just looking and, and finding uh, passages that spoke to this, uh, the book of Philemon jumped out at me, and uh, I want to go through a couple of verses here with you. Now, the story of Philemon is very simple and brief. Uh, Philemon was a, a Christian leader in the church in Coloss, um, and he was a slave owner, and he had a slave whose name was Onesimus who fled from him. But when he fled, he went into jail, and Paul just happened to be in jail with Onesimus, okay? And while Onesimus is in jail with Paul, Paul preaches to him Christ, and Onesimus says, yes, sir, I want Jesus Christ in my life as well, and I'm ready to turn my life over to him. And Paul says, that's great, that's wonderful. So Onesimus makes the decision then, he's a runaway slave, he makes the decision, I better go back then to Philemon. He is my master, and uh, I owe it, I need to go back to him. And I know this is in the context of slavery and everything like that, it's controversial, and there's lots of angles that we could look at this, but this is the, uh, the impetus for why Paul writes the letter of Philemon. He's trying to tell Philemon, your, your slave is coming back to you, but you need to receive him as a brother, not as a slave. He is now a believer in Jesus Christ. And it's, it's an, it's a, even though it's a, just a few short verses, the whole book, it's quite a, quite a study, and I've spent quite a bit of time in Philemon this week. Here's where um, I want to bring you, though. Philemon, verses 4 through 6. He's right. Now, there's some other recipients, but the main recipient is Philemon. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul says this in several of his letters. Because I hear of your love and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Um, Philemon was well known in the community. And Paul says to him, 
I, 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 I hear of your love and the faith which you have toward. Now, he uses two different Greek words here for toward. Um, in my Bible, they're the same word toward. I don't know if in your uh, translations, if they're different, but they're two different Greek words. The first one means the direction of, that you have shown love and faith in the direction of God. You have focused your attention. You're in the direction of God. And he says, and to the Lord Jesus, oh, to the Lord Jesus, and toward, and then he uses a different Greek word, ace, um, toward the saints. And this word means more toward the advantage of. So your, your direction and focus is on Jesus Christ, and you're helping, uh, bringing advantage and blessing to the community of saints. All right? And he commends him for his faith. He commends him for that love and faith. You have got a great faith. Your faith is doing great things toward the Lord and for to the advantage of the church. All right? Now, verse 6. Now, I want to tell you, I have not labored this long over a singular passage of Scripture in a long time. <clears throat> I have wrestled with Philemon, verse 6, for I, I've been dreaming about it, Mark. <laughs> I've been dreaming about this verse. I've been so uh, just uh, engrossed with it uh, because I think it's a fascinating thing, and I, I got into the story and everything. <clears throat> but this is from the New American Standard, by the way. And this is what he says in verse 6. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. Now there's about 18 sermons in this. I don't, I just, there is so much going on in this verse. As a matter of fact, there are no two Bible versions that I found that translates this verse uh, exactly the same. Because Paul is writing, uh, he's a very uh, uh, educated man, the Apostle Paul. He knows Greek very well. And he's writing to Philemon, who is also a very educated person. And he's using Greek words that are not common in Scripture or even in the Greek world. We don't have a lot of Greek uh, 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 comparisons to use in this verse. The word, the word here for effective is only found three times in all the Bible. Um, one is in, uh, the, another one of them is in Hebrews chapter 4 um, that talks about the Word of God being living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. That word active is the same word here. It's where we get the word energy. It's energase. Energase. It sounds like such, well, that's such a common word to us. It was not common, and it was not very uh, common that you would that uh, Paul would use this word. But the use of this word here is really what got me caught up in this. I looked at so many different Bible translations. I looked at old translations, new translations, paraphrases, and I was just really trying to get into what Paul is saying here. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. What does fellowship of the faith mean? What, what even does that mean? I pray that the fellowship of your faith. Well, what does that mean? Is it possible to have ineffective faith? Right? I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective. In other words, it can also be ineffective. If he's asking that his faith would become effective, then it's possible to have ineffective faith. Right? Isn't that, isn't that idea within this verse. This is something that challenges us at times. Sometimes we think as long as we have faith, that it's, it's, it's sufficient. But this verse illustrates that it's possible to have ineffective faith. What does that mean? Is it possible? Is, is, it, is faith that lacks effectiveness still salvific faith? Right? That gets to the idea of how much of the car do you need to have to still say it's a car? Is it possible to say, well, my faith may not be effective, but it's, it's still enough. You see, you see all the things happening here? Who's the beneficiary of the effective faith? It is not clear in this verse. Is it Philemon? Who's going to benefit? Who's the primary beneficiary? Is it Philemon? You need to have this or else you will not have effective faith in your life. Or is the beneficiary the church? Or is it the community? Who's the beneficiary of this? 
The primary, we know what, if one person has it, it's going to trickle out. But who's the primary beneficiary? And you know, it's interesting. You read some Bibles and they will, they will solve it for you. If you read the NIV, the NIV makes uh, Philemon. He is the recipient. But if you read other versions, they make the community the recipient. It's a judgment call. That's one of the reasons why the NASB has some problems, okay? But I like that it leaves it up to the Bible student and doesn't try to solve it for you in times like this. How does the faith become effective? Whose knowledge is Paul referring to? There's a lot of depth in this. But I wanted to answer this question. What makes faith effective? What makes faith effective? So let me, let me give you my translation. Let me give you my paraphrase of all of the, the time that I've invested in this. And I'm putting it up here, okay? Don't take this home as, as a, a, you know, the, a thus saith the Lord or anything like this. This is my best uh, uh, attempt to try to put the words of Philemon 6 into what I think Paul was trying to tell him in the context of the letter. I pray that as you live out your faith in your community, that's the fellowship of the faith, as your faith is lived out amongst those around you in Coloss, your faith will actively result in others seeing Christ in you. That's the effectiveness. That others will see Christ in you. And this will happen when you allow your knowledge of Christ's goodness and sacrifice for you change you into his character. That is when it will happen. When your faith is actively results in others seeing you is when you allow the Holy Spirit to bring the richness of, of Christ's blessing and character into your life. Anything short of that will re result in a failure of faith. Your faith will actively result in others seeing Christ in you. Question. Is this happening in your life? Let me, let me uh, bring one more verse here. It all comes down to character. But whose character? You know what makes me shudder? The calling of Christ on all of us when we accept Him in our lives, when we place Him on the throne of our hearts, is that when people see me, my job is to not help them see me, but to help them see Christ. Oh, it sounds easy. It sounds simple. But it's not. We crave the credit. We crave the attention. It is not natural to us. Colossus, right? That's where Philemon is. From the book of Colossians, Paul says this, God, God will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is a, a, a very uh, fancy way of Paul saying the gospel. Okay, The mystery of, 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 of the riches of the glory of God is, is, is uh, salvation by faith in Jesus Christ because of the sacrifice on the cross. It's all bound together. God will to make known all of those things, the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles. And he says, and it, this is what it is, Christ in you. Christ in you. Character in the Christian life. Character that matters. Character within our faith is when we have the calling and the ability to direct people not to ourselves but to Jesus. And it makes me shudder. It makes me shudder that at times people look at me and they don't see Jesus. Because I know I am not sufficient. I know that I have failed. And that there's nothing I have to offer people that gives them ultimate hope. Only by the work of Jesus Christ that is revealed through us does our faith become effective. Character matters, but it's not our character. 
It's our embracement of Jesus Christ and His character. And as we go into the days that we live with all of the questions, let's make sure people see Christ in us and not ourselves. Lord, it is a fascinating journey to dwell upon your scriptures and to really take time to absorb and study and examine. And I realize uh, we have such limited time uh, when we gather, but Lord, you're able to maximize it in your own way. I pray, Father, that each person who's been here would have heard from you and been able to see the benefit and blessing of one kernel that has been shared here today for your name's sake and for your glory, Father. We want to be a people in these days in which we live that celebrates and reveals your character in this world. Help us, Father, because everything in our flesh fights against it. Help us to submit to you every single day that your character would be developed in us, that our faith may have strength and be effectual. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Uh, potluck will happen momentarily. If you'd like to stay with us, if not, have a great week. We'll see you next Sabbath.